right. Good morning, everybody. It is July the 23rd, 2023, and it's Sunday, and there's got to be some good luck. We got double 23s. I'm not sure what that means, but let's just pretend that it's good luck, okay? All right. So what we're going to talk about today is Rex Hureman, because that's absolutely captured my, you know, fascination. The, obviously, the Koberger case, too, is front and center for me. Um, we also have Lori Vallow's sentencing coming up. And, you know, that judge in in the Vallow, Lori Vallow case, he's gotten on my last nerve. Um, I don't know what drives him beyond his need to protect Lori Vallow. It is incredible. And the thing that I am referring to is the fact that he has chosen to limit victim impact statements to two. Two. Why does he want to protect Lori Vallow? The, the victim impact statement um, portion of this entire this entire process is just what it says. It's for the victims. And now he's limiting it to two. There's no expanded coverage. So anyone that does want to come and, and be a part of the proceedings, listen and whatnot, they're not going to be able to get in. We saw the circus of the um, media that was there. They're all going to be standing in line. It was the same thing with the with the Barry Morphew preliminary hearing. By the time they seated the family members and the media, then you were left with, you know, 10 seats for the public. So it's going to be the same, same type of situation in Idaho. It's a very small courtroom and and it, it's it's amazing. It's real. It is lit. It is really just unbelievable that the very portion of the proceedings that is meant for the victims, the people that have lost their loved ones, now they don't get to get heard. Do you remember Larry Nasser's uh, victim impact statements? Wow. Did you have any doubt after listening to those impact statements? Did you have any doubt that this was a monster? You watch the whole trial and you think, wow, you know, he's gross and he did horrible things and he's unprincipled and he's immoral and he, you know, he's unethical. But you didn't get a real, like, deep impression of just what a monster, an animal Larry Nasser was or is until those victim impact statements. And when the victim impact statements came in and it was just one person after the next, one person after the next, one person after the next, you saw the real Larry Nasser. So why in the world is this judge limiting Victim impact statements to two. Why? So, so it's pretty obscene. It's yet again him making moves that really make rational people question who you protecting, big guy. Are you protecting Lori, the little frail little female, and you don't want her to be upset and tearful and crying? Or are you protecting the big, bad Mormon church? Maybe you don't want stories to come out about the religion that Chad and Lori bastardized. But that's not the judge's call, in my opinion. He may have the power, but he's going directly against the spirit of the law, in my opinion, to limit victim impact statements. It's just horrible. So that's my little rant. Um, it's, it's um, I believe it's on the 31st of this month. Should last a day. Um, it is, it's just, it's horrible. 
So Kay Woodcock will give her um, her statement. I don't know if Colby, maybe Colby didn't want to. Maybe he's had enough and he's just over it. He just wants it over. He just wants to heal and move forward. Um, it some there is a, one of the victims has written a letter to the judge. Perhaps that was Colby, um, but but I you know I just think this judge has overstepped what is decent many times, um, and 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 this was this was really out of man, this was out of line in my opinion. This was really out of line for him to do this. That. T- that as a as a mental health professional, those people being able to confront her and and give their story, tell her what how they impacted her, or how how she impacted them. That is a big part of them being able to make some peace with this nightmare and move forward into a healthy life. And this judge doesn't care. He only cares about, I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm not in his head, I don't know, but it looks like on the surface, it looks like he's either trying to protect the little lady, let's don't upset poor little Lori, or he's trying to protect the church, which I find quite interesting, right? Because it almost like makes it look like he thinks the church is involved but they're not. Am I right about that? The church had nothing to do with this. This was about two crazy people that took a religion and acted out in the spirit of the devil, not God. So why do we need to protect the church exactly? That kind of leaves questions. That would be it. That would be a nice little sit down conversation with this judge. So judge, can you help me understand a little bit about your, your position that you seem to run interference for the church? Why would you be so focused on protecting the Mormon religion, sir? The Mormon religion had nothing to do with the murders of these children. The murders of these children were three crazy adults, not the Mormon church, or is there something you don't know, judge, that we don't know, judge? So it's very curious. It's very curious. All right. Rant over. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, As I said, the Lori Vallow sentencing is the 31st. um, And so, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. All right, what are we doing today? Well, today we are doing the Rex Yorman interview with Bonjour Realty. And I put together a collection of information and this is how we're gonna do it. So this is this is my video that I'm about to play. Um, I did take clippings off of news and whatnot. I was able to get the interview from Hidden True Crimes Channel with uh, Lauren and um, Dr. John Mathias. Um, And so uh, that's that's how. And so this is going to be just a reaction and discussion kind of educational type of video. Okay. And before we start... Um, I want to talk about some of the um, characteristics of a serial killer. And these are characteristics that have been collected from uh, like FBI white sheets, research, personality experts. Um, and, and so this is, this is sort of a all around picture of the behaviors that uh, that many serial killers have in common. So of course we know 90% of them are men. That's that there are there have been females and there are active female and perhaps there's been more female serial killers than we want to you know believe. I think they call them black widow, right? Don't they call them black widows? The ladies that kill their their mates over and over again. They 
should be called serial killers. Um, serial killers are very often very intelligent. They're at least in the in the high average to superior range of intellectual ability. And it, it is possible that there would be far more serial killers if they weren't so dumb. Who's exhibit one? Perhaps Koberger? We don't know. He may, he may be innocent. We don't know. Um, but you have to be smart in order to commit these crimes over and over and over again and not get caught. So that may be why we think of that as a characteristic. Perhaps it would be better, uh, maybe the verbiage would be more accurate to say that, you know, successful serial killers have high to high average or high average to superior intellectual ability. Even though they have um, really high IQ, um, they very often do poorly in school. They can often move from job to job and will end up, even though being very smart, will end up as unskilled laborers or work in, you know, like in a grocery store or whatever. It, I thought that was very interesting because when you go back through Rex Uriman's history, there's a period of time in his life, he blames it on, in one of the interviews, um, he blames it on the uh, recession that happened in the 90s. But, but if you go back and look through his history, he had very frequent job changes. He had very frequent job changes when he got out of college and then he got married and was very quickly divorced. So he got married in 1990. He got divorced in 1994. He, he, uh, at the same time that he gets divorced, he starts his, um, fur, his architecture and consulting firm in Manhattan at the same time that he purchases his mother's home, his family home for $169,000. And, and so although he's intelligent, he started his own company and for all intent purposes, it does look to be a successful endeavor. Um, early on, there was a lot of instability. And, and then finally, once he's living in his, his, you know, family as a child, the home he grew up in, he's living there. He gets married to a woman who is very timid, an introvert. Um, and he's working, you know, he gets on a train and goes into Manhattan and, and works all day. From that point on, he's sort of locked in time. He's living in this place. And I kept thinking, do you not see the house, Rex? Are you not holding your head up when you walk up to the door every evening and think, wow, this is a slum house in a house in a neighborhood full of, you know, half million, million dollar houses. And you're an architect. Really, you should have the best house in the neighborhood, right? So what's happening here? This is very, very interesting from a psychological point of view. The, the, um, the inauthenticity of that is powerful. Now that I've gotten into it, Nerdy Addict is, is a great um, resource to go and see this. But, but now that I see all the land that was being purchased in South Carolina, it's curious that he chose South Carolina, right? Um, he and his brother seem to be schizotypal and trying to set up their own compound where they would never have to interact with people ever again. So at the same time that Yerman is taking all this money and buying land, ignoring the actual home that he and his family are living in, at the same time that he's doing that, he's doing interviews saying the most the most interesting thing about his job is that he had the the people having to learn how to interact with people. Everything about this guy is is dichotomy. It's chaos and control. It's out of control. 
pandemonium and then seemingly well thought out, sophisticated, linear think, you know, li evidence of linear thinking. It's, it's very unusual. And it, and I'm going to say this, it must have been exhausting for Rex Yerman to live this type of lifestyle. But apparently he and his brother were in the process of checking out of society, being able to go have their own land, you know, where other people can't come in and talk to us and interfere with what we're doing. Or were they trying to set up a place where they could hunt, if you know what I mean? Now, another important standout for people that later go on to become serial killers is that they come from unstable families, highly unstable families. Look, this is 2023. A lot of people have families where there's a lot of arguing and fussing going on, a lot of alcoholism, whatnot. But, but these people come from homes that are notably unstable. Uh, referrals to CPS, things like that. Um, very often, the majority of serial killers were raised by domineering mothers and were abandoned by their fathers. Now, this is super interesting where, where um, Rex Yerman is concerned because his father died when he was 11 years old. So he's just now really developing a relationship with, with his dad. His dad is teaching him how to do woodworking and that kind of thing. And then boom, his dad dies. And he's left instead with a mother who seemed to dominate everything he did. And one has to wonder, is that the reason that the first marriage ended so quickly? I did find her Facebook. I'm not going to put all that out there because that's long past old history. She doesn't want any part of any of this. Um, but what stood out to me is this woman's got a good life. She's got a, a normal life, happy family, doing normal, happy things. Unlike this weird getup that's going on in Long Island where you've got a hovel in the middle of all these, you know, beautiful homes. And the person that lives in that hovel is an ogre. It's very strange. So is that why the first wife divorced so quickly? She got into this and she realized this is wonky town. I don't want any part of this. Color me gone. Remember Alex Cox Lori Vallow's brother, he also had a first wife. Everybody was shocked when that came out. But how long were they married? She was gone within a year. Same thing. She watched all this going on with their family of origin, Lori's mom and dad and, and Lori and Alex and everybody. And she said, no, you guys are way too crazy for Cocoa Puffs. Uh-uh. I don't want any part of this. This is abnormal. Abby normal. Got to get out of here not right. And, and so she, you know, she made her get getaway. And I wonder if that is what happened with the first wife. And if it is, thank goodness for her. Thank goodness for her listening to her instincts. The other reason that I tend to go with the domineering mother um, stereotype is this, um, this orientation that as, as Rex, is divorcing without a job in a recession without a home his mom says buy my house so who benefited mom put one hundred sixty thousand dollars in her pocket think about it all right um, <clears throat> very often serial killers have families with psychiatric and alcoholic histories or criminal behavior. What do we know about Craig Uerman? Craig drinks a lot. 
and he killed the chief of police in a drunk driving accident. I would say that that qualifies as families with criminal, psychiatric, and alcoholic histories, wouldn't you? In more contemporary times, the lady at the grocery store said that Rex Yerman never came to the grocery store ever. I'm going to tell you, has been to has been to the um, grocery store far, far, in one year, he's been to the grocery store more than I have in my whole life. And yet this guy has not, never been to the grocery store and then went on to say that the wife always came in with the son and that she looked terribly depressed. Hey, Mystic Firefly, welcome that she looked very, very depressed. So again, that goes along with our story of families have criminal, psychiatric, and alcoholic histories. Uh, serial killers hate their parents. They hate their mothers and fathers. Notice I didn't say may hate, sometimes hate, often hate. They pretty well across the board hate their parents. But if you've been abused as a child, maybe you do hate them. Maybe they earned that hate. If you were psychologically, physically, or sexually abused by a family member, it might be very hard to remember that you love your mom and dad, right? And, and it is at odds with our very existence, our very identity, to hate that which brought us into life. It is the ultimate in dichotomous thinking that the person who, who gives you existence is the same person that you legitimately hate. That is very uncomfortable. Um, and is that the source of Rex Yurman's dichotomies that just, it, the dichotomies are just interwoven through every fabric of his life, every, every setting, every environment in his life. It's the extremes that are there. It is chaos and ultimate control. Many serial killers will spend time in institutions or have early psychiatric problems. There are also high rates of suicide attempts. From early on, uh, serial killers are interested in voyeurism, fetishism, and sadomasochistic pornography. And in fact, we do know um, that the uh, computers that Rex Gurman was engaged in all three. More than 60% of serial killers wet their beds beyond the age of 12. They are, many are very interested in fires, starting fires as children. And they are, they are involved in sadistic activity or tormenting small creatures Sometimes in childhood, but sometimes it's simply just um, all the, I mean, even contemporarily. All right. And knowing that something like this literally hits so close to home. Just, you always looked at it and it looked a little creepier, weird. Really hot day out and he was outside in overalls, chopping wood in the driveway. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. He talked to us about how he does woodworking and building furniture, and his father used to build furniture. His life as a husband. I thought this was so interesting. Because this, it, it, he tells this story over and over again, right? You, we've heard this story now from four different sources, but always the same story. One time from his very mouth in an interview, he says, oh yeah, I, my dad was a carpenter and he was a NASA scientist working on satellites and he taught me how to do word, woodworking and I still do the woodworking in the very same shop today. That's very interesting. 
when I first realized that he was repeating the almost word for word, the same exact story over and over and over, as if it is a rehearsed story. When I first heard the story, I thought, gosh, you know, he's trying to hang on to his dad. His dad left at a very early age, 11 years old. And so he moved into the house where he grew up. His dad was still alive. He's using the woodworking of his dad. He's, you know, I now I think I'm wrong about that. Or maybe there's a little element of truth. But now I'm thinking after hearing the same exact story nearly word for word with multiple people, I think this is part of his facade. I think that this is an invented story where it it's has kind of like this romantic flair to it, correct? It's a way for people to, even though he impresses as very awkward and unusual and, you know, socially clumsy, it's a story that makes, that humanizes him. It's a story that says, oh, look, he, his dad, this little leave it to beaver childhood that got repeated and he's just like everybody else. I don't know that to be the, the truth, but it's very strange that he repeats the same story over and over and over in the same exact words. Husband, a father and an architect seemed ordinary. Hey, this is Rex. I had a question for you. I wanted to touch base. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Good to see you. Likewise. I hope you don't mind. I brought my assistant with me, Norman. Oh. Hello, Norman. <laughs> That's Norman, the dog. And I heard somebody else say they felt like that Rex was a little, you know, irritated by Norman, but I didn't really see it. I didn't. I don't know. It's weird, but I, I tried to see. I, I, I can't see where it he had a seemed to have a negative. Maybe there's one part where he kind of looks back at Norman, but maybe that maybe that seemed a little, little judgmental. I didn't think so. I just thought it's like, I mean, if, if there's a dog in the room, I'm going to talk more to the dog than I do the human. So I just thought maybe it was curiosity from him. Maybe he's just looking at the dog to look at him or see where he was going or what he was going to do. I see it's raining out. <laughs> yes, it's raining. Really see, I look down at him again. Maybe that is, maybe that's a little of, you know, oh gosh, I hope he doesn't mess up the floor or why did he bring the dog or I hate, but, but I, that's not, I don't know. For me as just an animal lover, I just would have wanted to look at Norman again. I mean, it just, you know, I probably would have picked Norman up, put him on my desk to tell you the truth. So I don't know. Hard to say if he was upset by Norman. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Please. Okay. I know you said you like to do this outside, but Mother Nature is not cooperating. I think it was today. raining that least, day. So. That. All right. So I've cut it up a little right. bit here. I wasn't looking forward to doing this under a scaffold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Rex Huerman, um, Okay, an now I got a. Um, this is the first main thing that I reacted to. I watched it a couple of times before I thought, why does this bother me? And I, I kept going, you know, rewind, 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 and kept watching. I don't like how he has his arms open, his palms up. And I know if you listen to like the behavior panel and the, these people that do the, uh, or like, uh, what's his name? Dr. G, Dr. G, not Dr. Grande, Dr. G, um, you know, that open your, opening your hand, your arms up, your palms out, that that's supposed to be like a, um, that's supposed to be like a, a nonverbal, I'm an, I am an open book. I am telling the truth. I am honest. However, if you're a criminal element and you've got 150 IQ and you're looking up constantly about the Long Island serial killer and other, you know, murderers, and you're sure to run across these people that talk about body language, what if this is practiced? Would it like the story, the four, the, 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 uh, you know, my dad's a carpenter and a NASA scientist and he, we had a great life. What what if what if this is more of the facade that he has created 
trying to bridge that gap between his unusual, awkward distancing and wanting to appear to be just like me and you. So I don't like this presentation. Dun, da, da, dum. I am Rex Yorman. I don't think it was that. I think it was just this, let me open up. Let me do this, this body language that people will trust me and people will think, gosh, look at what a goofy, cool, nice guy this is who's being totally honest because he's got his palms out toward you. It just looks really contrived to me. It looks practiced. It, it doesn't look real. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. Oh, wow. Very long time. Okay. In some ways, it's like, gee whiz, I'm just a normal guy. I'm just a little old architect working in Manhattan. And, you know, like... That is the truth. It's almost like he's being confronted with the cops saying, um, what you been up to, your ex? He's like, what? Nothing. I'm a great guy. It's very uncomfortable. So uh, this brings uh, directly to my first question. So, you know, can you explain to our audience what is it that you do, not the architect part of your business, but the other part of the business, which is, is my understanding that you're kind of a facilitator with the department of building. Is that correct? But please tell us. That's correct, but much more. Okay. I am no ordinary man. I am special and unique, not only among my peers, but of all of mankind. That's what we're about to find out. <laughs> what That's I do, much more I'm interested. I do troubleshooting, architectural troubleshooting, and negotiations with the building department. Okay. What I mean by that is, do we do the standard stuff with the building department? Um, handle your filings. Um, I have other clients who are a lot of other architects, mm -hmm. and we'll handle their interactions with the building department. Yeah. Especially out of city architects because they're a little afraid of the city. Because the city is big and bad and important and Rex isn't afraid of the city. And Stop when city. so they when need to hire not, him because should have been routine he, he suddenly routine, becomes yeah, not routine. Yeah. I get the phone call. Gotcha. Whether it's an old building and they need somebody to understand when he says, I get the phone call, I get this image of the Batman light shining over Gotham City. Somebody, please, quick, get Rex on the line. Stands and can maneuver the 1938 building code or the current building code. You look surprised when I say 1938 yeah, building code. Uh, yeah. um, I've actually used. You look surprised when I say the 1938 building code, see because I'm so much more than you. I have so many important facts in my head that you can never have. The 1901 old tenement laws here in the city of New York, and you can legally do so. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's one of the little things that- I want you guys to take a good long look at what is your right hand, what would be his right eye. Or if you're him, his left eye. What do you see there? What do you see? What is on? What's wrong with his with his left eye? But your if you on your right, he has a serious black eye. He has a serious black eye, and if you look, when he turns his head a little bit, you can see that his cheek is also very bright red and bruised, almost like you tried to cover with makeup. But no doubt, he has a serious shiner. It is swollen, the top lid and the bottom lid. It has still got dark bruising around the orbital bone and then the red, the, the, uh, red part of the cheek itself. 
it would be very interesting to get in touch with Bonjour Realty and find out the exact date that this video was filmed. Don't you think? Martin, he totally walked right into that door. Probably a magnificent door, the kind of door that me and you would never be able to see because we're not Rex Spearman, right? He is one special and unique guy. That that you do. People don't always understand when it comes to building codes. Yeah, yeah. They never read the administrative section. <laughs> People are incompetent. They're dumb. He's not. See, see the judgmental look on his face? This guy has set himself apart from all others. <laughs> oh, that is a that is a chilling that is a chilling look on his face. What do y'all think? Must have hit himself in the eye with that ball peen hammer. That's right, Brent. <laughs> Even his lip is puffy. I just I I stopped it here. Yeah, Sundown Farms. I took a photo, stopped it and took a photograph of that moment. There's your predator. There's your predator right there. I think he looks like Harvey Weinstein. But I I do think that in in this moment you you see the real Rex. This is disdain, this is contempt, this is sadistic pleasure. Let's see what he said right before this. I'm sure it was something judgmental against yeah. others. They never read the administrative section. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I get them. They never read the administrative section. I find the details and that's how I get away with what I want to get away with. This guy right here, this is your predator. In this moment, they never read the administrative section. He might as well be saying they don't pay attention to their surroundings. They don't think ahead of time. They don't look at the obscurities that I see. And that's what's made it possible for me to get away with murder for 13 years. That's a scary guy right there. I'm telling y'all. I cut it up here for comments. Of who? <laughs> in 1987, when I came to work in the city, <laughs> the first architect I worked for was Harvey Rustenberg. Okay. Great man. That year, a new law came out. Local law 58 of 87. Okay. That's all the handicap access. Oh, okay. They said, Did you? You're the new guy. You read it. So... I read you it. read it. There was a situation dealing with the city. They said, well, go meet with the city. I did. I was effective at it. Again, this sounds practiced. It's like the story of my life told in a way that I look superior. He said, go do it again. <laughs> and I did. Oh, that's funny. And it's that's how the funny. whole thing started. It's not funny, okay. Bon Jour. We did a lot of work with not-for-profit agencies okay. for developmentally disabled. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started doing a lot of my building code, code consultant with him, as well as the design and drawings yeah. for these facilities. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I learned very quickly was... Yeah. The building department could not understand them. Again, understand. people are stupid. Rex is not. People don't, they're not conscientious. Rex is. The world is a, is a dumb and stupid place. And Rex is here to help all of us dumb and stupid people. What, they, they have 
their own codes, their own laws, <laughs> because you have what we would call a group home for developmentally disabled. Okay. It doesn't exactly fit the code book. And the plan examiners who work for the building department didn't fully understand it. Again, so, we have more dumb people. Not only do you have city employees, attorneys, and whatnot that don't understand city laws, now you've got more people who are dumb, and, and Rex has to come in and, and take over and fix everything. Part of my job became educate the city. Oh, now he now he's educating the entire city. He's an architect. But because of his immense intellect and the general overall disdain for the stupid little insects that walk among him, it's his job now to educate the whole entire city. To educate the city about their own code. Correct. That and Bonjour you know, is building our, up his our laws. <laughs> That's been something we've been doing ever since and we still do today. So you started with a with a, a firm, and then when you decided to launch your own, you decided you are let me continue that route of the consulting. Is that correct? That's basically correct. Yeah. But the way but it all happened, I didn't have a job, you see, and it was the recession of the nineties, and so I gave my mother one hundred ninety thousand, one hundred seventy thousand dollars, and then I opened up a little tiny consulting firm in Manhattan and because I knew a lot about code that other people didn't and I made a niche. That's not the story you're going to hear. What happened was, was a recession in the early 90s. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, and yeah. we're all trying to figure out who to work for. Someone knocked the hell out of this guy, y'all. Look at his, look at this from this side. This is swollen so bad and bruised. His eye is just Days ago, this eye was was shut, I believe. As big as this is, it, it was. And now you can see, look at his lip right here. It's bruised and swollen. So it would be very interesting if Mr. Realty could tell us the exact date or tell the police the exact date of this interview. The cops need to know. Um, it even looks like he's swollen up here a little bit. Doesn't he? Doesn't that look a little bit? It's hard to tell because it's so blurry. I I did zoom really far in. I know that it's dirt, you know, it's it's blurry and messy, but I really wanted to make sure that what I was seeing was accurate, that he is in fact swollen and bruised, and and he is. Yeah. And that's when I met my very, very first paying client, uh -huh. Robert Meyer. Robert Meyer, okay. I'm in the Queens building department. It's before lunch. I want to get to lunch. We're back in those days, you had to physically stand in line yes. with your paperwork because this predated the computer system. Yes. And he was dealing with the clerk at the certificate of occupancy counter. Didn't know what he was doing. I'm getting impatient. I go, excuse me. Took his paperwork explain to the clerk what he needed, then explain to him what he needed to do, then move over. Then I took care of what I needed to do. <laughs> okay, what are, you, what are you guys hearing here? Do we hear the narcissist? He got kicked in the face. I think so, facing realty. Um, it, 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 the, the, um, the sense of entitlement, the narcissistic, view of the world it is all there when you look at the dark tetrad it's all here everything in this you see it all throughout this entire interview hey elizabeth it's okay it's good good to be here um i wish we knew the date as well sundown farms we know the date that it was uploaded we don't know when it was actually recorded this guy, Bonjour Realty, he does a lot. He's done a lot of interviews with professionals and and not professionals around New York City. Um, so people that do that kind of thing, they might do an interview and it may not get uploaded for six months. 
So it's not really helpful to know when it uploaded. It we we really need someone needs to ask him when when do you even know when you actually did this interview? But the cops need to do that, in my opinion. <laughs> he was standing off on the side. And I thought, I, you know, I, I interrupted the story. I'm going to go back a little bit so we can hear the whole thing. But I want you to notice again this idea that he is in control. He is in control. He is omniscient. He knows everything there is to know. It doesn't even have to be everything it is to know about his job. It's everything that he needs to know about everybody else's job as well. They overlook facts. He does not. He he can walk into any environment and take over. And yet his own life is a mess. A literal mess. Chaos and control. It's the perfect serial killer. The certificate of occupancy counter. Didn't know what he was doing. I'm getting impatient. I go, excuse me, took his paperwork, Just explained to the it. clerk what he needed, then explained to him what he needed to do, then move over. Then I took care of what I needed to do. <laughs> he was standing off on the side. One of the main reasons uh, people are contacting you is that because they were badly advised or because they too, they don't know uh, all the rules or they try to rush things? Is that what, what is basically most of the reason why people are contacting you for? I would say the biggest reason, yeah. they're overwhelmed by the city. Mm. They're overwhelmed. They can't handle things. He can by the size complexity of the building department yeah and whether it's a restaurant a place of assembly um a forty thousand square foot retail that we yeah. did he couldn't just say a retail store he has to make sure through words through hyperbole he has to make sure that you understand just how important he is because you know the bigger the project the smarter the guy, right? So he can't just say a retail establishment. He has to say a 40,000 square foot store retail, blah, blah, blah. It, all of this is designed to impress you. Who do you know in your life that talks about their job like that? No one. Well, unless they're a raging narcissist. The majority of people recognize, regardless of what their job is, is to do in this world, they recognize they're doing a job. And no one in their social circle really is going to be impressed by what you do at your job because it has no meaning to them. But for this guy, the way he talks, and there are a few other people, some of them online on YouTube, who who talk about themselves in hyperbole and big flowery language and they blow up situations to seem far more impressive or hurtful or antagonistic than they really are but that's all designed for one thing to be impressive did last year uh -huh. or somebody's co-op or it's their mother's co-op and she passed away and there's an old application that's 20 years old that nobody addressed that they have to solve to sell it. People get very overwhelmed, yeah. not just by the agency and how to deal with the agency, but the complexity of we got plumbing work, structural work, construction work. There was mechanical work done. There's a list of requirements, 20 something things long in the computer. But Rex, this is the reason that they hire architects and consultants because the old lady with the co op, she's not trained to know these things, but an architect or a consultant is. You're no different than any other architect. The, 
anybody, any architect you hire would be able to do those things. But he's making sure that he's presenting himself as, you know, the first world wonder. Judah, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So tell me, is this part of the, because you're an architect, uh, is this part of the business has outgrown your architect uh, business or it's, it, started, it started taking over or what? Is, Sometimes it's the majority. Really? Yeah, that's Sometimes it's 50-50 with architecture, depending yeah. on what I'm doing. Yeah. On the architectural side, having all of these capabilities in-house gives me an advantage over and other people because exactly. yeah. I have my own staff. Yeah. Most architects will go to an outside consultant. Like yours. No, not like mine, oh. called an expediter. Ah, okay. And oh, okay. That's what there is the no other as great as they understand how to file, they understand the administrative procedures. Where I exceed that is I have my I have the license to practice architecture. So when I go to the city, I can tell them what I, how I feel and what I think they should do. Yeah. And I do that. <laughs> um, he loves that it. control. He loves that power to be able to go to the city and kind of pull rank and say, okay, guys, listen, you know, I'm the licensed professional in the room. I need all of you guys to sit down and be quiet. You're far too stupid to understand what I do. So just let me tell you what you need to do, and then you just do it like you're supposed to. I I think he legitimately loves this control, that he is getting some mo mildly sadistic delight in that he's sort of talking down to them and and treating them like, you know, you're you don't you're too stupid to know this. And so I'm not going to explain any of this to you. I'm just going to tell you what to do. And if you know it's good for you, you'll do it. I, th I think this is part of that list of characteristics of serial killers. This is just another box to click. I can't do that because yeah. they work at the pleasure of the city. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. Understand. Yeah, yeah. So, uh uh, you know, after all those years, what do you think uh, is the most impor important qualities a person uh, in your in your position uh, dealing with the DOB must have? Patience. <laughs> That's funny. I, I, I was hoping you would. Now, what kind of people talk about having patience? Is it people who are working together as a group and they all respect one another's individual talents? Does that require patience? No. Anytime I can think of a situation that requires patience is either when I'm doing something that's difficult, like threading a needle, and I have to be really quiet and calm to do that, or there's an immense power differential in the relationship. When there's an immense power differential in the relationship, then the one with the most power, the one who is the most intelligent they are the ones that have to have patience with the little peons. Isn't that right? So look how quickly he says patience is the most important thing. And look at that look on his face again. The predator is returned. He doesn't like people at all. And that is reflected in him gathering together 200 guns, no telling how much ammunition, and he is amassing acres, hundreds of acres to form his own little, you know, the country of Rex. And God only knows what happens in the country of Rex. Probably the law of the jungle would be my guess. Say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> patience. And I don't like to use the word tolerance, but sometimes. Oh, yeah. but I will. <laughs> I don't like to use that word, but gosh, there, there's just no other word. We godlike men have to demonstrate tolerance for those beneath us.
people that are not nearly as competent as I, I have to show patience and tolerance. Have to. Yeah. And it's not just with the city. It's also with the client because most clients, they don't understand what I have to do, why I have to do it. Most what it takes clients to get done. don't yeah. understand. And when you're been dealing a with somebody in the city, the whether it be a clerk at the counter who has to enter data entry, or if I'm dealing with the borough commissioner of Manhattan, yeah, you need the patience because who knows what the person before you did. Sometimes they have very bad days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, More I've actually, flawed people. <laughs> I've actually gone to the commissioner's office, sat down in his waiting area yeah. at 11, 11 30 in the morning. Sloppy. And a little after five o'clock, I heard him finally holler out, Is Rex still there? <laughs> That's how long I waited. Oh, God. Or the guy just didn't like you, Rex. The guy just didn't like you, and all you had to do is pick up a phone. You know what I mean? Why do you have to go hang out in the man's office? I'll tell you why. Very likely, one minute, please. Very likely because how is Rex going to get his narcissistic supply of I'm so smart, I'm patient and tolerant with you, little, you know, underling. Let me explain to you these very difficult things that you possibly, you just possibly could never understand. How can he get that narcissistic supply when he picks up a phone to explain to the other guy what's going on? That's why the man left him sitting, <clears throat> pardon me. That's why the man left him sitting in his office eight hours, in my opinion. It's because the guy was like, oh my God, no, no. <clears throat> please not Rex. I, I not Rex, not today. Please no. It's only my opinion. Because <laughs> that particular client, yeah, I had to see the commissioner. They were the only ones who could give us an answer. Again, Rex is important, and nobody else can do the trick except the commissioner. That's just he has access to the commissioner and that's he wants everyone to know it that's just how it is okay got it oh Jen, so this is a perfect segue do you have a story where um the situation and we don't need names but do you have a story where situation seemed you know very very doomed but you were able to deliver at the end do you have, do you have now i'm going to say something guys i was not impressed by the story that he told I thought it was going to be some story about, you know, the building crumbling down on an orphanage with 21 little babes and swaddling. I thought it was going to be something where, you know, he sweeps in to save the day, right? That there's going to be, this, that there's this terrible problem about to emerge and he averts tragedy. Instead, he took the opportunity for a story, a, a lackluster story, a fairly normal problem to encounter when you are in a city that was being built in the 1800s and here we are in 2020. It was a pretty simple and common problem that they have the supplies to correct. But he, he takes this opportunity to tell a story, to say, look how smart I am. I'm smarter than other people. Rather than, let me tell you about this crazy thing that happened one time. It's very, it, this interviewer was not happy with this interview. Have a, like, a, a good success story to tell us? There are so many different ways. I'm of sure. Looking at it. Um, <laughs> but you have one. Well, only, only one. Okay. One of the first ones to come to mind. Yeah, go ahead. Was a building downtown Manhattan. Okay. They put a generator on the roof. Typical generators go on roofs all okay. the time. Uh -huh, okay. Except the fuel lines to feed the to feed the generator will run through the exit stair. 
Let's ah. see. Pumping diesel fuel through an exit stair, that generally is not a good idea. <laughs> this doesn't sound very safe to me. <laughs> no. And I'm not even in your field. And we're talking a 20-something story building. Even better. Um, <laughs> the architect who I was working with at the time, I called him, didn't answer, I called him, did, I called him four or five times. He finally picks up the phone because he happened to be at Passover dinner. Uh, and I told him what was going on. All I got was dead silence, then the, oh, my God. Okay. Now, you would think, how do you solve this without yeah, you tearing that, everything yeah. apart? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Meet with the commissioner of Manhattan Building Department, and I start negotiating how to do this. Okay. And I got very creative <laughs> with... <laughs> It is almost hard to listen to, isn't it? The constant, I I know, Martin, right? The, the constant, the constant self-representation that's just, uh, so, you know, I, I, I had to negotiate. I had to get very creative. No, it, it's a problem that emerges all the time. This was not unique. Let me let me tell you why, why I say that. In Egypt, oh yeah, this is 100% to glorify himself. The man cannot even get out three sentences without somehow interjecting this idea of self-aggrandizement. Uh, look at me, I'm better, or all these people in my orbit are smaller and less than. It's very, and it is, it is even the, you know, some of these guys are uh, entertaining, okay? Some of them have superficial charm. And so even though they're building themselves up and they're telling tales of their heroic escapades and journeys and impressing others and creating, you know, astonishment in the listener, they're still ultimately selfishly, you know, operating from the position of a narcissist. This guy is doing it, but he is so socially clumsy and awkward that he's just a buffoon. It's just like, why are you wasting my time with this mundane little story where nothing happened. There's no, there's no apex. There's no, you know, uh, like mountaintop in your story. It's just, so we wrap the pipes. <laughs> That's basically the, was the end of it. Right. So it, it huge ego, incompetent, insecure. Exactly. Vicky. Yes. Huge ego but really all imagined. He, he's not what he's built himself up in his own mind to be. And that has to create a great deal of animosity and anger. I want you to think about this another way, please. This guy who believes you, you've heard, you've heard this, right? Word salad, right? Scarlet. You've heard this. You've heard all of this individual. Yeah, we're going to do that, Big Ups. Um, we've heard all of this individual. I'm so great. I'm so smart. I'm so perfect. I'm, I follow up on obscure details. No one else does. Other people are incompetent. Other people are messy and inconscientious, right? I've heard all that. But can you imagine being him, a guy who's built himself up, a legend in his own mind, being made to sit in another man's waiting room for eight hours. Can you imagine what was brewing beneath the surface? The anger. Think about that. This, it, that was not a good day, I think, probably to be Rex Gurman's wife. First, you have to address, I got flammable liquid, combustible liquid in my stair. Not good. Can I separate it from the stair? 
Okay. That was question one. Second question is, do you still have enough room for the legal means of egress in the stair? It's so bizarre you that you have he to maintain minimum widths, minimum capacities to get everybody out. Yeah. So this became a mixing of building code negotiation, <laughs> the use of modern <laughs> products to achieve all of this. That's called architecture, Rex. It's not special. It, it's special. I couldn't do it. Uh, but people that are trained as architects, this is what they do, y'all. I mean, yeah, they do design big, beautiful, pretty buildings, you know, and all that. They do that. But but there's another part to the work that they do, and that is to take old buildings and bring them up to code as you modernize them. That's why if you buy an old house, you have to hire an architect or an electrician or what, you know, whatever your particular problem has to be. This one was combustible, you know. And in the end, yeah, the pipe stayed. The pipe stayed. They stayed. I achieved a four-hour separation from the stair using autoclaved aerated concrete block construction. Nice. And on the Chinese hor- to me, but I'm sure. And on the horizontal <laughs> run, yeah, I used a I mean, 3M bonjour. product to achieve the fire rating. So it became a mix of art and science. <laughs> And the understanding of the code to make it work. Yeah. The art and science is architecture, right? But then he threw in and the understanding of the code. And he's already established that he knows the code better than anyone. He has obscure books from the 1800s. And he, make no mistake about it, he's read every one word for word he knows every code there is he is a legend in his own mind literally and that's what i applied to each job um i actually just purchased this purchased a copy of the 1922 building code oh because i'm dealing with a building that was built in the late 20s but it's not yet under the 1938 code so i'm in that slack water between 22 and 38 and i need to prove that the condition was legal at that point at in that time, point in time That's which is why at home i have an extensive library i'm sure of obsolete books <laughs> bond your realty is killing me he's like oh i'm sure you have big big beautiful shiny books big Beautiful books, books like no other, none have ever seen. Big and beautiful books. <laughs> okay, so it, notice this sentence. I have an extensive library of obsolete books. People want to know why. Rex, why do you have the 1920 code? Do, do you see how he's got to use these very um, powerful words to, to create this illusion of important stature? It's at the heart of narcissism. And people want to know, why do I have a plumbing code from the 1970s? Yeah. Uh-huh. When I do work for either attorneys or have to look up something historical yeah yeah i need the reference for that point in time exactly yeah nickers you're exactly right <laughs> what his, is this job? his books now belong to uh, suffolk county talk to you about yourself i think it's taught me more about how to understand people ah. what did i do What happened to the video? Um, where'd the video go? Video's gone. Hold on. That's weird. Um, hold on. Hold on. Let's talk among yourselves. 
me see what happened here. Or I could sing a song. No, we don't want that, do we? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Very strange that that did that. Okay, right? We're, okay, I got it. Hold on. Right where we left off. Sorry about that, peeps. Share screen. Okay, and it's, like I said, it's right exactly in the same spot that we were in. Here you go. All right, is it showing on y'all's screen? It is. Make sure the sound is up. Everything's good. Time. Exactly, yeah. Okay, just went back a little bit. Is it just me or was Rick shocked at the dog's name, Norman? Also <laughs> like Norman Bates. <laughs> uh, taught you about yourself. I think it's taught me more about how to understand people. Because dealing with the technical aspects yeah. is something a person can learn. Mm -hmm. You go to school and through an architectural program. You work for the experience of doing architecture. You get your license to practice. Yeah, yeah. As you your time goes preacher, on, son, you and learn about the buildings and about the codes and the different buildings of time frames. I'm dealing with a building from the 1880s right now. You know how they react. But it's the people, how they're all so different and how you deal with the people, I think, is one of the... Right, exactly, Elizabeth. Aspects that have come out of this. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. My last question. Okay. There's the predator. He's nervous right there. Tool, Look at him. Or an object to help you uh, in your uh, to help you. He's a smug. To bring your business to greater. This guy right now. He's there's there's about to be double speak happening where there is the semantic communication, the words he's using, but he's making reference to something below the surface. Like, what do they, what do they call it on Twitter when you tweet something? Subtweeting? I think something like that. So there's, there's double communication happening here. This is the predator. Look at the smugness. Look at the sadistic delight on his face as he does this. The heights. What would it be? That's an interesting question. It's Hello. not an interesting question, <laughs> because <laughs> For what I do, we have to have so many tools in the toolbox. Uh, just one. Just one. Just one. Or an object. It doesn't have to be a tool. It can be an option. You know what? Yeah. I know. All right. Y'all get ready. One of the things I learned from my father was furniture building. Okay. He was an aerospace engineer and built satellites. <laughs> and Runs in the family. So he gets he gets asked this question about if what's the one tool in your toolbox that you require to do your job well, and he says, "Oh well, we have lots of tools. It's a very important job. It requires many, many, many tools, exquisite tools, but you can only choose one." He's uncomfortable. You see him take this big, deep breath. He closes his eyes. He leans his head back. He's going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I don't know what it, what, oh, my God. He's asking me to, abs There's a, this is an abstraction. I'm not prepared for this. I just simply want to give details of my boring life. I don't, he's asking for me to truly communicate. Oh, my God. And what does he do? He pulls out his comfortable story that says, hey, look at me, I'm Rex, I'm normal, I'm just like you. Me and my dad had a relationship. My dad was a notable fellow. He had the salt of the earth as a carpenter, a man who used his hands, and he had the brilliance of a NASA spy, uh, scientist exploring strange new worlds. 
look at me. I'm Rex. I'm special. And I'm just like you. I'm not a killer. I wouldn't hurt a fly. Trust me. Believe in me. He pulls out this story like a comfort blanket. Now, let's see. There's, there's going to be double communication happening here. The semantics of the words he's saying. But below the surface is the real story. And watch his face. The smug, sadistic delight is there. Yeah, building <laughs> things. <laughs> and build furniture at home. And I still build it in the same exact workshop. So? I have one tool that's pretty much used in almost every job. And it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. Can we, oh, okay. And cabinet maker hammer. Okay. It is persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something. It's Not someone. Something. <laughs> he is just objectified human beings. This question that this interviewer asked was, what is the one tool that you need to do your job? This is not a man that is out on location building houses every day. Not that kind of architect. He's told you multiple times throughout this interview that his job is about people, <laughs> incompetent people, people that have a problem being conscientious in their own worlds or jobs. He has to come in and save the day with his greatness. That he, the most important thing about his job, he has to have, um, what was it? Patience and tolerance. People don't pay attention to the details. He's now telling you that all those people that he has disdain for, all the people that he has to go around cleaning up their messes through his brilliance, the one tool that he has is a hammer, a, a dangerous hammer. And when he says, when I've got something and I need to persuade it. This is your predator. <laughs> and it always yields. Oh, you want to know why he's laughing? He's laughing because he thinks that you don't know what he's talking about. He thinks that you think he's talking about a hammer. Is in almost every job. And it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. Can we, oh, okay. And Cabinets maker hammer. Okay. It is persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something. Not it, someone. Something. <laughs> and it always yields excellent results. Yeah. And at the end of the project, whatever piece of furniture or what I'm working on, it always whatever piece of furniture or what he's working on helps it come out beautifully okay great so you would be is that duper's delight does that look like a smile filled with mirth or is something dark and frightening lurking behind that smile He's looking at Bonjour Realty like Bonjour is an insect. He's looking at Bonjour Realty smiling and looking at him like, you are too dumb to have any idea what I just told you. It kind of a, that kind of hammer. Now, did you see, did you see him kind of throw his head back? Watch. He tells this story about this hammer and this object that he's going to persuade. When you're building a damn cabinet, you're dealing with an inanimate piece of, of wood. You're, you don't have to persuade it to do a damn thing. You just measure, what is it? Measure twice, cut once, right? 
you have to persuade it. In fact, that doesn't sound very precise at all, Rex. That sounds like someone who doesn't know what they're doing and they're trying to force that cabinet to do what they, he wants it to do. But you're not really talking about wood, are you, Rex? Now watch the body language that goes with this story at the end and the smile and does it really, does it really look like joy? To come out beautifully. Okay, great. So you would be kind of a, that kind of hammer. That is that right, that, that it move at the end when he finishes the story about making it do what he wants it to do comes out all it all ends the way it should end he smiles but it's a scary dark yucky sick smile and then he throws his head back in defiance he throws his head back in some way it's a little bit bigger sort of like you have no idea what i could do to you bonjour realty watch it beautifully okay great so you would be that is not a happy smile right there that is a snake. That is a shark. Kind of a, that kind of high. See it? He's looking at Bonjour Realty like, I could cut your throat and walk away without my heart changing beat. And Bonjour Realty has no idea who he's sitting across the depths from. This body language from someone sitting in my office, I would be trying to get them out of my office as fast as I could. I'm here for your, uh, for your business. And he's, look, he's, he's got that power built up in him. He, he's having trouble getting grounded. He got into that fantasy of what he's doing with that hammer. He got into the fantasy and he's, he's having that, that compulsion, that sick, dark power that he craves so much, it's trying right now to bubble to the top. He's having a real hard time getting himself grounded again. You can see him fighting with it. Yes, that's what you're saying? You have, that doesn't yeah. exist? That's what you would be? Sometimes I have to be the <laughs> heavy framing hammer? The heavy framing hammer. It's such a bizarre moment. This, this tale that he's telling with the hammer and everything in the aftermath, it's so bizarre because he, the question was, what's the one tool that, that you really need for your job? What's the one tool? And now we suddenly see this guy just turn into a different creature. I'm going to let this, I'm going to let this play. I'm not going to say anything. Okay. All right, I'm going to be quiet. Persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something. Not it, someone. Something. <laughs> and it always yields excellent results. Yeah. And at the end of the project, whatever piece of furniture or what I'm working on, it always helps it come out beautifully. Okay, great. So you would be kind of a, that kind of hammer for your uh for your business that's what you're saying you have, that doesn't yeah. exist that's what you would be sometimes i have to be the <laughs> heavy framing hammer <laughs> the heavy framing hammer. other times i'm the lightweight hammer just to <laughs> nudge things along all right i guess it's a hammer we got it that's it folks that was rex owner founder of rh consultant so if you have any building regulatory issues please contact him it's probably going to solve your issues. How are you, ma'am? I don't know. Are you driving right now? No, I'm inside the house. I'm sorry? I'm inside the house. What house? I don't know. Can you trace where I am? I'm sorry? Can you trace where I am? No, I can't. What's your callback number you're calling from? Huh? What phone number are you calling from? What is up there? Please. Are you in Suffolk County or Nassau County? 
Um, I'm in Long Island. Where on Long Island are you? No. 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 No, stop. No. Where in Long Island are you? In Suffolk County? Nassau County? Huh? Uh -huh. Why? Why do you call me by my name? Why? Can you on the line? Stop. Stop it, please. 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 Please stop. Please, can you shut the door? No, time to go. Please. 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 Go that way, please. Come on, let's go. Come on, roll that. That's just a good place. No, please. I think that sounds like Rex Yerman. Why? All these men are in that room and saying, come on, come on, come on, let's go outside. There's like four or five different voices. Y'all, come on, come on, let's go outside. She keeps saying, no, 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 no. Uh, what are you going to do? He says, where do you want me to go? Listen. What are you going to do to me? I'm like... Why? Huh? Yeah, I don't know. It was kind of me. Why? Wait, are you going to call me? Call me? Why are you going to call me? Why are you going to call me? I'm in the middle of nowhere. What? In the middle of nowhere? I think, based on this call the way that the bodies were located and the eyewitness reports the morning after, I am convinced that this is a group of men and they were hunting these young women. I believe that in my heart. And I know that that is so fringe and that is so weird and it is so crazy. I know, trust me, I know. But it is the only thing that would explain the aftermath of this phone call. She went a different direction than all those other girls. All right. We are done. I hope that you guys have a relaxing and wonderful Sunday. And I will be back. I think think on maybe Wednesday, but it may be Friday. All right. Y'all have a wonderful week. Bye.